You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. Joining us right now is Dr. Leanne J. Webb. She's assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. And so certainly glad we're here. Uh, first, um, uh, uh, Dr. Webb, I just want to give our condolences to your friend, of course, the emergency room doctor uh, out of New York uh, who uh, passed away earlier this week. And so it's, it's certainly been very tough for so many of uh, doctors um, having to deal with this. And, 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 and we've been hearing, we've had them on the show, and we're hearing from medical, medical people uh, who, uh, who were just overwhelmed with the onslaught of what's happening around this country, and it's it's actually not slowing down. Part of the scare is that we're not doing enough testing, so everybody's like, this thing could easily ramp up that quickly. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for the uh, condolences. What I will say about Dr. Breen was that she was a wonderful medical director, which is basically my direct supervisor or boss when I was working at New York Presbyterian, the Allen Hospital. And she really was a fierce and, and passionate advocate, both for the physicians that worked under her, as well as um, the patients. Um, I have many great stories about her being an advocate for patients, and she will always, in our minds, be be a hero. Um yeah, we're just we're 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 mourning her loss in a in a really heavy way. Um, so in terms of the testing, we we have not tested enough people yet, and so you know there's a lot of talk about reopening the economy. But what we know is that there have been certain guidelines set forth, some of them by the White House Task Force, some of them by the CDC. Um, and what we ultimately know is that these are only guidelines, right? And so our Constitution is not set up so that the um, at the federal level they hold all of the control over what's going on from a public health standpoint. So they've issued these guidelines and the states take it upon themselves um, to follow the guidelines or to not follow the guidelines. And in many cases, there are states actually skipping steps here um, in this phase uh, approach to reopening. And that's that's very concerning, um, particularly what we need from a uh, public health standpoint to break this transmission chain is one, we need widespread testing and we need retesting as well. Like we need to be able to retest people. Two, we need to be able to take those sick people and isolate them in an effective manner. We need to quarantine our sick people. And then we need enough infrastructure to actually complete the contact training tracing in a meaningful way so that we can also tell those people to uh, self-isolate, right? And so that's the basic of uh, uh, breaking the transmission chain of coronavirus. I, I understand the economic arguments. I really do. I went to business school. I understand. I understand on another level that people are, are suffering, including a lot of people that I know. But I do feel like in this instance, health has to come first. Well, because the Look, you can, you can have all the job you want to if you are sick and then all of a sudden if you're dying and then now you got to pay for funerals and all of that, it doesn't matter. You're a business owner like myself. You don't have a business if your workforce is out uh, in, in the hospital trying to recuperate. Absolutely. And this is the other thing about it. Some of these guidelines are not practical. So if you look at the CDC and the draft that they put out, they put it out specifically for certain groups, including for schools um, and for uh, uh, businesses that have vulnerable populations or vulnerable people uh, working for them. In the school guidelines, it has things like keep the desks six feet apart. What what classrooms do you know of that can really effectively uh, right desk six feet apart? Which now, which, which which now means that you probably are going to be cutting classrooms in half. So now what happens to like, those other students? What? Yeah, so a lot of those things aren't thought through. There's another section in there which talks about what to do. Uh, for employers if you have employees who are vulnerable, right? And so if you look at the employees who are vulnerable, one, they would have to raise their hands and say, hey, I'm vulnerable. What does that do in terms of uh, discriminating against people, right, in the workplace? That's, that's one issue. And the other thing, if you look at the specifics of the CDC's draft, is that they say if your employee, um, for instance, rides public transportation to work, they should be encouraged to telecommute at home. But we know, unless you're living in a place like New York City where everyone 
pretty much uses public transit. If you're somewhere else and you're using public transportation, nine times out of 10, it's because you can't afford that car to get you to work. And nine times out of 10, you're a frontline or essential worker who's getting lower pay. And um, you probably won't be able to telecommute from home. So some of the guidelines just aren't practical. Um, So it's just unfortunate. Um, Let's see here. Questions from our panelists. Robert first, then Rob. Absolutely. And I want to thank you so much for all all the work that you and all the other medical professionals are doing. Uh, For people who are in states such as Georgia, where I am, and uh, who are going to be going back to work uh, and not following the guidelines as the state has uh, set out, we haven't had two weeks of reducing numbers. The numbers are increasing day by day, uh, even now, but we're reopening our economy. What will be your advice to workers who have no choice but to go back to work or lose their job? Uh, and uh, as far as protecting themselves and making sure that they can uh, step in where the government is not providing that leadership. Yeah, so I think that's a really important point, and that kind of speaks back to what I was saying before, like states are actually skipping these guidelines. In phase one, there's sort of a gateway criteria um, that the government has put out on the federal level that says that uh, essentially the data uh, has to be downtrending in terms of the number of uh, new cases and deaths and and actually the number of people who are, are tested as well, so the surveillance. Those numbers need to be downtrending for 14 days. That's what it says, and some people are skipping that. Um, so for the worker who is forced to go to work, essentially, I'm sorry, I uh, apologize in in advance. That is not a good position for you from a health standpoint. Um, the things you can do would be the things that we're already pushing right now. So social distancing, which is also part of the guidelines that the government has released. So making sure you're at least six feet away if you can. However, we know that that's not really practical. Um, making sure you wear something that is uh, cloth, so a mask a scarf, some type of clothing that is covering your face and not just your not just your mouth because we're seeing a lot of people, I personally am seeing a lot of people out right now where they might have a mask on, but it's actually here. So it's not actually covering their nose. It needs to be covering your nose and it needs to be covering your mask. It needs, or your, your mouth rather. It needs to be washable. So if you're wearing this to work every day, you need to go home and, and wash it every day or have multiple masks that you can actually switch out. Um, and uh, you really need to have a serious conversation with your your employer about all of the ways that you are being protected when you go back to work. And I do think that there is something that some of these non-essential businesses can learn from the essential businesses who are doing it right, but they will have to find those businesses. Employers will have to seek out those businesses locally. Rob? Yeah, um, I have one question. I have two comments before that, just based upon what you said, Dr. Webb. Uh, two things. When you look at the economics of the situation, as you mentioned, and it's hard for people that are that don't have jobs. I, I actually think that's because of our lack of our government's response. Other governments don't have that. We haven't had, as I said, uh, you know, 30 million layoffs in Britain, for example, where, they, where they're where uh, they taking care of about 75 percent of the wages and directly giving businesses money for that. So I think the answer to that is if people can't work because, because of health reason, that's where we're supposed to have government. But this is by design because we have an ineffective government, too. When you talk about essential workers, you know, there's a general strike today. I just I would be remiss if I didn't bring that up with Amazon and many others that are out there that are our essential workers that are doing the work that we all like. To, there's all these popular commercials because the data says it's nice to thank people. But at the end of the day, it's good to pay your workers. So with that, you have workers that let's say you have some of these essential workers or now non-essential workers that are coming back out and they get COVID-19. You know, what would you advise them? Because I know there's some new laws in terms of how they go about approaching their employer. Yeah, so the first thing that they need to do is really contact their primary care doctor or reach out for medical help if they have issues surrounding COVID-19. Um, those people should definitely not go to, you know, I say this as a health professional, knowing that some people feel like they're forced to go to work, but um, they, they should not be going to work. Um, so if you're they're having a fever or cough or body aches, a sore throat, if they're sick at all and they're concerned that they could have COVID-19, those people should not be going to work. I, I, I hesitate to give sort of... Um, uh, broad advice about what to say to your employer specifically. Um, there are some protections in place for some businesses um, so that people can have paid uh, medical leave. Now, I don't know what that looks like going forward once people actually um, open up more of the economy. Supposedly about 35 states will be either fully open or partially open by the end of this week. And so um, that's a personal conversation to be had with employers and probably need to get some lawyers uh, involved as well. Um, But definitely they should not be going to work if they feel sick. 
All right then. Well, um, Dr. Leanne J. Webb, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Uh, hopefully, uh, people will listen to the health experts and not the nuts in the White House who don't actually care about people's health, especially considering all Donald Trump has done has been three years trying to destroy the Affordable Care Act. So we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yep, thank you so much. All right then. Every single night. We've got some of the top black experts. You're not going to see them on cable news or broadcast news because you swear black people aren't experts when it comes to this health crisis. That's why we have this show and why we do what we do every day on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Joining us right now is retired General Russell Honore, the nation's first black surgeon general, Dr. Jocelyn Elders, John Hope Bryant, he is the founder of Operation Hope, Senator Kamala Harris of California, Dr. Sadrina Calder, retired General Lloyd Austin, Congresswoman Karen Bass, Commissioner Omari Hardy, Bureau President in Brooklyn, Eric Adams, Dr. Joseph Graves, America's Wealth Coach, Deborah Owens, Dr. Corey A. Bear, Patel Salt. Uh, Howard University student, Pastor Jamal Bryant, a doctor, uh, Christy McDowell, Benja Ajilore, senior economist at the Center for American Progress, Gilda Daniels, again, author of the book, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. Four stars, uh, General Kip Ward, Dr. Oliver Brooks, is president of the National Medical Association, president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris, Joby Benjamin, Dr. Alexia Gaffney, infectious disease specialist, Dr. George's Benjamin, uh, executive director of the American, American Public Health Association, Malcolm Nance, family medicine physician Dr. Jen Caudle, Dr. Tashaka Cunningham, a molecular biologist, Kat Stafford. She's a national race and ethnicity reporter for the Associated Press. Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, uh, who is the president of Howard University, Congresswoman Yvette Clark uh, from the state of New York, William Spring, AFL-CIO economist, uh, Andrea James, executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. All right, let's go to Capitol Hill. Congressman Gregory Meeks, Congresswoman Anna Johnson of Texas, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Minnesota Senior Amy Klobuchar, mental health clinician Jamie Singletary, Prince George's County State's Attorney Aisha Brayboy, as well as Dylan uh, Harry, ACLU Justice Division Strategist. Uh, Dr. Cindy Duke, uh, she's a virologist, Principal Steve Perry of Capital Prep. Health and wellness specialist Dr. Yolandra Hancock, Desmond Mead, President of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, Cliff Albright, who is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Michael Harriet with the group, the Mina McWhorter, founder of Love by the Hand of Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president, Merida Bennett College. Corner Michael Fowler is the mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, mental health therapist, Suzette Clark, Justin Gibney, attorney and political strategist, and Bishop Vincent Matthews Jr., Dr. Suzette McKinney, CEO and executive director of the Illinois Medical District, Dr. Leon Madugo, president elect of the National Medical Association, Jana Bailey, Mayor of Moss Point, uh, Mississippi, uh, Mario King. We're going to keep driving this thing to make sure our people are fully aware, safe, protected from coronavirus. You get the top medical experts, the top business experts, top political experts, top religious experts, because that's why we do what we do, unapologetically and unfiltered. Ain't nobody else in the black media space doing what we do. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.